the Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour. Just remember that the show is made possible through listeners and viewers like you. Just go to thepaulleslie.com and click on support the show. Thank you to all of you who have contributed. Now let's get into the interview. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a returning interviewee. I'm seated face-to-face with him, which is a double pleasure. He's an excellent thinker and writer of both fiction and nonfiction. Last time he was on here, it was episode number 419. You can still listen, pick it up anywhere you get your podcasts. But at this time, Dr. Douglas Young has authored a novel, Deep in the Forest. It has five-star reviews all around, which is quite a coup after his 33 years in the classroom. He's always been a writer of everything from newspaper articles, poems, short stories, but now a bona fide novel, and it's getting a lot of attention. He's done several interviews on radio, but most of all, garnered a lot of enjoyment from readers. I'm going to read just a little bit of the back cover of the book. Elton Peabody is a 35-year-old high school history teacher in a small southern town who has a terrifying experience one night with a mysterious bright light deep in the forest behind his house. Did he encounter a UFO? A secret government project? A high-tech prank? Angels? A mental breakdown? Or something else? And before I welcome Douglas Young, I would like to read this quote from Harry Cruz. If you wait until you got time to write a novel, or time to write a story, or time to read the hundred thousands of books you should have already read, if you wait for the time, you will never do it, because there ain't no time. World don't want you to do that. World wants you to go to the zoo and eat cotton candy preferably seven days a week. So, Dr. Douglas Young, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me. I am so touched, honored, and humbled that you would invite me here again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. So, how does it feel to sit here and see there is your book? What what goes through your head when you see that? It's a dream at long last made real. I had a wonderful time being a professor for 33 and a half years. I don't regret it at all. But ever since I fell in love with American literature in high school, I have nurtured a dream of one day becoming a novelist. And now uh, that dream has at last been fulfilled. And I'm just thrilled. And I'm overwhelmed with the tremendous reaction and thus far all positive that the book has garnered. And uh, I'm just very blessed and grateful. Has there been a compliment about Deep in the Forest that you really, really appreciated? Oh, gosh. Offhand, no one stands out. A lot of people have written or said that they loved it, that they really liked the, the lead character, Elton Peabody. People have commented on the humor. One fellow Southerner and former student told me that she recognized most every character in terms of lovable characters from her her small uh, Southern town growing up. I think that the fact that this book taps into many genres, science fiction, UFOs, mystery, romance, comedy, family dynamics, friendship, high school dynamics as seen from the perspective of a young high school history teacher. I think that because this book cannot be pigeonholed into any one genre, that broadens its appeal quite a bit. A lot of folks from a lot of different backgrounds have told me how much they've enjoyed it, which is is very gratifying. Well, I can say I have been enjoying it. I'm about halfway through the book, and I'm always getting in the mail, as you see, I'm getting lots of nonfiction. And reading Deep in the Forest, it reminded me, hey, it's still summer. Enjoy. Thank you. (laughs) And that's the number one 
thing I would like for people to get out of the book, that even though it's a drama, really, I think more accurately, it's a dramedy. I think it's primarily a drama, but it has lots and lots of comedy. This is not Tolstoy. I mean, it's a light, fun summer read. I want people to enjoy it, to have a, a, a lively escape, and to, to think seriously about serious issues, serious matters, but to really enjoy themselves. That's the number one goal of the book. I'm delighted that from the feedback I've gotten, apparently that that goal has been met. As I was reading from the back of the cover, the book Deep in the Forest, it does involve UFOs. The book couldn't have come out at a better time (laughs) because there's all these reports and stories about UFOs in the media these days. My question is, have you ever had an encounter of the paranormal or the ethereal kind? Not of which I'm aware. (laughs) Let me preface my full answer to that question by saying that this novel is not a science fiction novel. As much as I love science fiction, particularly people like Philip K. Dick and Robert Heinlein, while there is certainly a science fiction element to the story, Mm -hmm. it really, the, the vast, vast majority of the book does not concern science fiction. And... I don't want to give anything away, but but there is, while yes, there is or there are UFOs in the story, they're not necessarily aliens from outer space. There's a lot of mystery to the right. story. But to directly answer your question, I'm not aware of ever having had a UFO experience. Two experiences come to mind uh, at the moment. One was I remember as a boy... I was probably maybe about 13, and this would have been in the mid-1970s, which was a period of history when there were loads and loads of UFO reports. Eric Von Danigan's Chariots of the Gods had come out, I think, in the early 1970s, and so there was a real rash of UFO news stories. And I'll never forget, we were coming back to my hometown of Athens, Georgia, We had been out of town visiting my mother's side of the family in Wrens, Georgia, near Augusta. And it was uh, around sunset. And we noticed for a long time uh, coming into Athens, there was a a strange, bright, white light in the sky. And, oh, we were so excited. I was thrilled that we were watching a real live UFO. And I'll never forget when we got about a block from our house there were people leaning in our neighborhood, leaning uh, against their pickup truck with a shotgun aimed at the UFO. And I actually included that element in my novel. And as soon as we got in the house, I raced to the phone and I immediately called WRFC, I think it was, or WGAU AM Athens Radio, to report a real live UFO. And the radio fella uh, answered very calmly, very patiently, well, it's actually a weather balloon. So I learned my (laughs) real-life UFO was a real-life confirmed weather balloon. The only other, and I guess the only possible UFO experience I ever had, uh, which I'm aware is, several years back, my sweet Cheyenne and I were standing on the edge of Lake Von Clarken in Flat Rock, North Carolina. And it was at night, and we saw a couple of bright white lights in the sky, but they were way too low to be stars, Hmm. and they they just didn't move. And so we wondered what they were, but I'm not aware of any reports or of any official sightings about that. Uh, So my guess, who knows what it was, but to me... UFOs have always been endlessly fascinating. And I'll never forget, many years ago, the late uh, fantasy author, Tom Dietz, who's from uh, Northeast Georgia, he told me that uh, what today are reported as UFOs in centuries past were reported as angels or as ghosts. Mm. And so I think as I've written in a poem of mine called Reaching Beyond, I think in this secular age, what in earlier times we would have thought of as angels or ghosts or maybe even monsters, now we we think of as UFOs. But I think that there's a deep 
human love of mystery. Now, we, like cats, we, we, we want to solve mysteries. But so much of this life, I think, is unsolvable. A, a novelist told me years ago that uh, he heard the great late Georgia novelist Harry Cruz tell an audience that the problem with one particular character in one of his novels was that he thinks the world should work and the world does not work. And one of the themes of Deep in the Forest is that ultimately, arguably most of life is a mystery. There is an enormous amount of mystery to this existence. As the pastor who was the the primary uh, role model for the, the lead minister in the novel, as he told me this week, if we knew everything, we'd be God. Only God knows everything. I mean, right. it's uh, part of the essence of being human, human is to struggle with what is real and what's important. And so I think that UFOs just sort of, they're, they're arguably a, a, a dramatic, striking modern day metaphor for the mystery at the heart of human existence. Uh, I think there is a, uh, an almost a quasi religious dimension to the UFO phenomenon. I think that it's not a coincidence that it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense is that in, in every UFO story I've ever read about or in every UFO documentary I've ever seen, the UFOs, if they're portrayed as having aliens from another world aboard, the aliens are always portrayed as being far, far superior to us, right. almost godlike. And I think that maybe especially, again, in this more secular age, we want to believe that there are superior high-tech alien civilizations that have come here. That, that's, that's almost uh, the closest thing seculars can get to you know, there being a god. So I've always been fascinated by UFOs. I would love to have a UFO experience, <laughs> uh, provided I was not abducted, and, and provided I had photographic or, or filmed video evidence of it. I mean, I'd hate to be caricatured as a quack or a phony conspiracy theorist. And I wouldn't want to be alone. I'd want fellow witnesses to be with me. But provided it wasn't too terrifying, I think it'd be the greatest, most thrilling, ultimate experience of life. <laughs> Interesting. Something that I noticed throughout the book is that many of the characters, they have very colorful names. Oh, thank you. Is Elton Peabody a combination of the names Elton John and George Peabody. You're half right. Okay. Growing up, my biggest musical hero was Elton John, now Sir Elton John. And he's still a huge musical hero. And I've always loved the name Elton. And to me, I guess like Nigel or Colin or Clive, that seems to have remained a quintessential English name. Uh, Elton doesn't seem to have caught on in the colonies, or not in this one anyway. So yes, Elton was, because I've always thought it was a cool name, I did want the lead character to have that name. Peabody was just, I think, the first last name that came to my mind, or the first one that sounded good. I, The Peabody <laughs> is not named for George or any other famous Peabody. With names of characters in not just this novel, but also in my second novel, which I'm now editing and, and shopping around to publishers, with characters' names, I deliberately want to choose original, striking, as unique a set of names as possible so that the characters will be hopefully more memorable. And uh, I just think that uh, why in the world would, would I want to give characters names that are boring, that are just common, everyday names? I want names that will stand out. And I'll confess to you, talking about names, when I wrote the first draft of Deep in the Forest, it was in the summer of 2017. And if you'll recall, that was the summer when there was an epidemic of vandals tearing down first Confederate and then even non-Confederate statues. And I was so livid that these American Red Guards, really, were imitating 
the Red Guards of Communist Chairman Mao Zedong in China's Cultural Revolution in the 1960s and 70s, this destruction of history and tradition and heritage and our past, I decided that maybe a, a, a subtle way to rebel against uh, these uh, terrorists from trying to, to erase our history would be to give a lot, not all, but a lot of the names of characters in the story, the names of Confederate generals. Hmm. And so I, and I'm sure you probably recognize several. I did. Um, and what's funny about that, Paul, is that the company, the publishing company, that ended up publishing this novel. It's a small publisher in the little town of Red Bank, New Jersey. And Red Bank, uh, its claim to fame, for a jazz fan like me anyway, is that it's the hometown of the great Count Basie, the big band leader and pianist. Well, and now that's scintillating trivia, plus a dollar fifty will buy you a coat. But in any event, <laughs> well, these sweet young Yankee editors... When they got the draft of Deep in the Forest with all these Confederate names, bless their little Yankee hearts, they did not catch a single one of them. <laughs> so not one was censored. They all made the final cut of the novel. So score one for Dixie. <laughs> and, and let me just say for the record, because I would hate to be misinterpreted about this, my view about tearing down Confederate or any other statues is I don't want any statues to be torn down in this country. I don't, I mean, when I travel, when Cheyenne and I travel up north, we, we travel all over America. And I encourage people to travel as much as they can, not just to America, but all, all over the world. Because as Mark Twain put it, and I'm having to paraphrase here, forgive me, but Twain said that there's nothing like travel, you know, particularly going abroad to shatter stupid stereotypes and myths about people. And I think that, I know that when Cheyenne and I go up north, oh, I deliberately make a point of going to Yankee uh, museums about the war between the states, and I take pictures of Yankee statues of, of uh, you know, Yankee war heroes. And I have no doubt that even though, as a, a Southerner, I'm a, a life member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the Military Order of Stars and Bars and of the Longstreet Society, as in the Confederate General James Longstreet Society. I have no doubt if my ancestors had fought and died for the Union, I would be a, a loyal life member of the Union of the Sons of Union Veterans. Absolutely. And so I think that we should all learn from history, from all of history. And we should get as many different perspectives on uh, everybody and every movement, every party, every phenomenon in history as we can. We should read as widely as possible. As my father, Dr. T. D. Parker Young, uh, has said many times, a, a real, a true university, a real university worth its salt is a true free marketplace of ideas where everybody is welcome to express his point of view and where as many different perspectives are taught as possible so that everybody can be super as well informed as possible and can think more critically and analytically and always independently. One of the clubs that I was so delighted to, to sponsor for decades at the University of, of uh, what is now the University of North Georgia on the Gainesville campus is the Politically Incorrect Club. And one of our mottos was, there's no such thing as a politically correct or incorrect opinion. We welcome all points of view. And just like in my classes, when we would discuss any controversial issues, like in club meetings, when uh, if the students want to discuss, let's say, abortion at that day, that week's meeting, if the only people speaking up were all pro-abortion rights, I would be against them or vice versa. Right. Uh, what you know, we want as an educator, I wanted to expose students to as many different competing ideas, competing perspectives as possible. So that was uh, one of the driving forces behind why a number of the people were were given the names that they were as sort of a, a subtle way of saying, look, um, you can't erase history 
by tearing down statues, and 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 you shouldn't really try. Right. Um, and of course, I think it's instructive that, especially if we look at the the, the people who were tearing down statues in 2020. It wasn't just Confederate statues that were torn down, but also statues of Abraham Lincoln were targeted, statues of Frederick Douglass, statues of George Washington. I think there's a real present day 21st century AD war on American tradition or American history itself. Yeah. And so I wanted to, uh, in subtle fashion, do my part, uh, uh, take my stand against that. (laughs) Well, well done. It, I did catch those those names of, of historical figures, by the way. You know what? So far, and maybe a lot of people have, but so far you're the first reader to tell me that you caught those. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. How did the inspiration for this story come about? That is a really fine question. And all I can say truthfully is that decades ago, occasionally just when I had some free time, maybe walking or just daydreaming, I would occasionally have this thought of what if somebody one day had a UFO encounter and he was not any professional UFO hunter. Uh, He never wanted to have a UFO encounter, but he did and he couldn't explain it. And what if he was thrust against his will into the public spotlight and maybe stereotyped as, oh, the UFO man? How would he deal with that? You know, how would he go on with his regular life? How would he handle that emotionally? How would other people treat him? How would having had a a bizarre experience like this and and having to deal with all the public scrutiny that accompanies it, how would that affect his relationships with family and friends and and, uh, other important people in his life? And I never sat down and consciously thought about it. I I never took notes about it, but I would just think about that occasionally. And then in the probably the, the mid 20 teens, when I was in I was in the latter half, uh, mid to late 50s, I was thinking, you know, if I'm ever going to fulfill my dreams since adolescence of of writing a novel, now's the time. I really ought to kick it into fifth gear. And in the summer of 2017, I had some free time uh, between semesters. I had roughly about two months, about eight weeks. And so as a, a, a conscious decision, I decided I'm going to at least try, at least for a day, mm-hmm. I'm going to see if I can write uh, something about this idea I've had for so long about you know someone having a UFO experience and how he dealt with that. And so I kid you not, Paul, when I sat down to write the thing, I didn't even know if I could write a short story. <laughs> and I also, I had some trepidation because I remember the the Ernest Hemingway quote in which Hemingway uh, wrote, oh, uh, writing is easy. You just sit down at the typewriter and bleed. Yeah. And so I had this image of writing a novel as being akin to this horrific, emotional, uh, cathartic experience in which you're having to go through so much pain. But, Paul, it was absolutely the most enjoyable, creative endeavor of my life. I loved it. (laughs) It was just mesmerizing. I've been a writer ever since I was a teenager in terms of writing essays. And for close to 20 years, I've written poems but I had never written short stories. I mean, I wrote a few very short, few short ones in, in grade school. Uh, but I, I, I'd, and I'd certainly never written a novel. And as much as I love writing essays, there are some constraints. I mean, it has to be within 800 words. I have to organize them. I'm, I'm making arguments that have to make coherent, rational sense. There's sort of a, there are bumpers that I have to stay constrained within. And with the way I write poetry anyway, too, as much as I love to write poems, I, I, I'm a traditionalist. I write poems that rhyme. I like to have every uh, line should have the same number of syllables um, as the one before it. I, I write in four line stanzas. So, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a certain rigor. There are rules that I have to follow. Well, the joy of writing this novel and the second novel, too, was 
other than basic punctuation, there are no rules. It right. was it was just thrilling to just follow my imagination. And as I was having these thoughts seemingly coming out of nowhere, you know, they were, you know, flying through the keyboard and through my fingers, and I was seeing them on screen. It was just a, a joy. And I feel so blessed to be writing in the age of the computer. Because I remember writing when you had to type. <laughs> uh, I remember when I wrote my uh, master's thesis in the uh, latter 1980s. Oh, I, it was a cut and paste job. I remember typing it and using scissors and, <laughs> and tape. And so I've long loved writing on the computer, but, but writing a novel was just the most liberating uh, writing experience of my life. I absolutely loved it. And quite frankly, I didn't even have an outline when I wrote it. I mean, I only once I was maybe close to halfway done, what turned out to be about halfway done, and I, I was having more ideas about where the story was going. They were coming faster than I could, you know, you know, flesh them out. Then I would come up with different chapters, you know, I'd be several chapters ahead in terms of general themes that I would explore, you know, developments that I would pursue. And and with the second novel too, when I began it, I, I had no outline. I just had some general ideas and, and had certain characters that I wanted to really explore. And just based on the character development and characters meeting each other and, and having forming relationships, that just sort of led to different activities and and developments and themes and plots. I have found that writing fiction has been far more fun, frankly, than any other kind of writing I've ever done. It, it's just been joyful. Nonetheless, do you have any kind of routine or any kind of, oh, I, I tend to write at this time or anything like that? Yes. Yes, sir. In that I try to get up in the, right as soon as possible after I get up in the morning uh, get up, eat breakfast, do very just a few quick tasks before I get to uh, the computer. I want to write when I'm fresh, and but generally, quite frankly, I mean, I'll, I'll write for several hours, take breaks occasionally to get up, and walk around, flesh out ideas. I mean, I've got a lot of energy, and so I'll just walk around uh, the house and then take a break for lunch, go back, write for several more hours. And then at a certain point, I just sort of get exhausted, hmm. generally by dinner time. It's funny, that first summer that I was writing the first novel, I'll tell you, even though I didn't have to get up for anything work-wise, I found that I didn't have to set an alarm clock <laughs> and to go to work. And I, I still would go to the office on the campus, and uh, I found that I was going to work early and earlier. I was looking forward to it, and I stayed later and later. And when I wrote the second novel earlier this year, after I retired from the university uh, last December, here again, I would start writing pretty early in the morning, write for several hours until lunch, take a lunch break, then write for many more hours, and then call it quits for the day. I would try to, with both novels, though, I would try to stop writing at some point early in the evening, because if I continued to write after the early evening... I would have so much nervous energy. It would take a while for my brain to sort of settle down. I'd have a harder time going to sleep. That's why I never like, I mean, I loved all the classes I taught, but ideally I didn't want to be scheduled to teach a night class because I found that I had, I was so pumped full of energy from walking around the classroom, lecturing uh, at night that I, it would take me longer to go to sleep. I would need some time to unwind. Also what I, have found was the case with both novels is that I would generally write for several days and then at a certain point I would just need to take a break. Not from writing, but well, I would take a break from from composing new material. I would write for maybe four or five days and then for the next day or two I would edit mm. what I had written. But when I'm in that writing phase where everything is fresh when I'm writing new material, I want to write as fast as possible to just let it flow as naturally as I can. Now I'm always to a certain extent double checking it uh, each you know paragraph by paragraph, but I don't get too hung up on making it perfect. After three or four or five days of writing new material, then I'll go back with sort of a fine tooth comb and 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 
make it uh, make sure it's right punctuation wise, spelling wise, but but even more so making sure that it just it sounds better. I like the word choices better. I try to have a fair amount of alliteration in my writing, and and I like to. I guess the poet in me likes to have a, a certain rhyming scheme at times. So I, I just I love writing. My only regret is that I didn't start writing fiction a whole lot earlier. <laughs> uh, but the biggest reason why I decided to retire at fifty nine last December was to become a full-time writer. I mean, I had done everything I ever wanted to do as a professor and so much more. I, I loved it. It was a wonderful ride. I, I taught 20 courses over a 33 and a half year period, mostly political science, but also history classes, uh, sponsored some wonderful clubs, Democrats Republicans Club, which became the Politically Incorrect Club and the Chess Club. I don't regret any of that, but I just figured, you know, I'm getting close to to 60. If, if I'm ever going to write those novels, I need to do it now. Mm-hmm. And, and if I ever uh, get a Jones for teaching again, if I miss the classroom too much, I can always go back and teach part time. Right. But so far, I'm loving writing too much to, to want to take a break from it. Do you see yourself in the character Elton Peabody? Yes and no. It's a, a totally valid question. I know that a number of my favorite writers, I think, primarily or largely wrote about themselves. I mean, um, uh, Ernest Hemingway comes to mind. I think a a number of his protagonists are based to a great extent on his own life. I think Charles Bukowski's recurring character, uh, Hank Chanowski, or Hank Chanowski, I think, I think he Hank is is clearly based on Bukowski to a great extent. Cinematically, I I can't help but think that a lot of Woody Allen's characters are based on his real life uh, <laughs> persona. So there are similarities between Elton Peabody and myself. The similarities would be, and then I'll go through the differences. The similarities would be that yes, we're both Southern, single, Protestant, Presbyterian, white male educators, teachers. We both have a fascination with UFOs. and We both went to graduate school. But there are a lot of differences, too. Uh, he grew up on a farm. I grew up a faculty brat. My father was a, a distinguished professor at the University of Georgia in Athens, whereas Elton grew up on a, a rural farm in a small town. I grew up in uh, middle-class suburbia in a medium-sized city. Elton had a nervous breakdown in graduate school and was not able to complete his graduate studies. He he didn't get a PhD. I was blessed to to be able to get a PhD. He taught high school. I taught college. Uh, He taught history. I taught mostly political science. I've had a lot more romantic experience than than, uh, Elton has had, although Lord knows I'm I'm no uh, big romancer. So, yes, there are certainly a number of similarities, but there are also, I think, a a significant number of differences. Something that occurred to me, and this is probably going to be a valuable answer to people who listen. I don't know the answer to this, and I get a lot of people who write to me, and they say, I've just come out with an album. I've just come out with a book. Mm Mm-hmm. How do I get interviews? How do I get publicity? Mm -hmm. You've done quite well with that. Think about that for a moment and tell us how were you how you were able to get these radio interviews, the publicity that you've been getting for this book. What's the secret? I've basically taken, for the most part, a break from writing. Mm. I did two or three days ago add a couple of pages to the second novel. I had an idea for a, to enlarge a scene to add some humor, but for the most part, since Deep in the Forest was published on July 19th, a month ago today, I have been my own agent. I mean, I don't have an agent. And so what I've been doing each day, and and boy, thank God I'm retired from the professoriate so that I've got time to do this. But what I've done is I've just personally gone online, thank God for the computer, and I have called and emailed loads of radio stations. I have contacted people like yourself to ask for interviews. 
I you know, got interviewed by the Gainesville Times, my hometown paper. I have contacted people about book signings. I've just directly emailed and called folks. I've gone to libraries. I've called librarians about speaking at libraries. I'm donating books, copies of the novel to different libraries. I'm reaching out to book clubs. Also, I'm, I'm utilizing my Facebook page. I'm posting a lot of stuff about the novel. Uh, whenever I go on the radio, I, I try to remember to get a picture taken of uh, the interviewer and myself in the radio station. I'll post that, and then I'll post uh, the Amazon and Barnes & Noble links to the novel. I've personally contacted loads and loads of uh, Facebook friends and acquaintances, former students and colleagues and uh, buddies I know via Facebook. Um, I've emailed gobs and gobs of people in my life. And uh, it has just been enormously gratifying that people have been so supportive. A great many people have been really stunned uh, that I wrote a novel because, again, uh, my professional life was that of a professor, uh, an academic, someone who taught political science and history. Some people, people who knew me better, knew that I loved to write and, and had wanted to be a novelist at some point. And so they were, I think, all the more thrilled that I had followed through at last. So it's really been a, a lot of work, but uh, it's been very uh, gratifying. Now, some of it's been kind of tedious. A lot of times I'll make sure that I'm listening to music when I'm you know, emailing folks again and again and again. But uh, for the most part, it's it's been a real joy. And uh, it's been so touching to, in the course of reaching out to people, often folks who I have not had contact with in a long time, it's been a real joy to get to reconnect with folks, to get reacquainted, to find out where they've gone in their lives, what they've done. So it's been a lot of fun meeting up with people. It's been a thrill to sign uh, novels, to autograph them. That's been a real joy. I've even had folks send me copies of a novel to, to sign, and I'm delighted to do that. So to me, this is all gravy. It's I, I feel incredibly blessed that I wrote this novel, that I got it published, that it's gotten just an almost uniformly rave positive reaction. Um, I'm extremely touched and honored and deeply humbled. Well, this one came from a regular listener. We've, it would be almost too small of a word to say he's a friend of the show, but he wanted to know, is Dr. Young a fan of the late Robert Frost? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. I think he was a magnificent poet. And while of the, the poems that I've written, the bulk of them have been uh, romantic poems, a, a really significant minority of my poems have been uh, about nature. And I love uh, the romantic nature poets. Wordsworth is certainly one of my all-time favorites. I love Blake. And so, yes, Frost is, oh, I think he has a, a beautiful, lovely rhyming scheme. And uh, gosh, his metaphors, I mean, his poetry is so visual. I mean, and just his word choice, uh, it's just hypnotic. I, I adore Robert Frost, absolutely. Well, thank you, John Paradise, for that question. But on that note. Yes, thank you, John. More than just poets, just any kind of writer, who are the writers that you would say have had the biggest influence on you? There's no one writer who towers above the rest. The first who comes to mind would be John Steinbeck. He is my favorite novelist. Now, I don't think that his writing is the most beautiful. For my money or for my reading, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Mm has the most beautiful writing. I mean, to me, especially some of those early short stories like Diamond as Big as a Ritz, The Ice Palace, stuff he wrote in the early 1920s, to me, I mean, that's just poetry as prose. I mean, the beautiful metaphors, the descriptions, uh, it's just uh, captivating. I love that. But as wonderful as Fitzgerald is, I think 
his subject matter is often somewhat limiting. Um, generally, the rich, it's about the you know rich, beautiful young people, and then the protagonist maybe wants to be one of them. For me, and, and, and Ernest Hemingway has certainly been an influence. Now, Lord knows I would never compare myself to him or to any of these folks, but uh, I so admire how Hemingway is able to convey so much with, with so few words and how he's able to describe characters and situations so well with almost no adjectives or adverbs. It's just all nouns and verbs. I mean, that's just, I mean, he pairs his prose down to just the absolute essentials. But to me, his writing often is not emotional enough. Uh, it's a little too dry, a little too distant. And at times, it's in danger of being sort of like Ian Fleming's James Bond novels, where <laughs> you've got people who uh, they're not fleshy, they're not emotional, they're not real enough. For me, John Steinbeck is, he stands, he would be my most influential writer, I would say, because at least the way I have read his novels and short stories, they come across as the most naturally told to me. They're not as pretty as uh, uh, Fitzgerald's prose. They're not as pared down. They could probably be edited more. They're not as pared down as, as Hemingway's. But uh, they're, uh, the characters are, are more relatable to me than the, the characters in Fitzgerald's or Hemingway's prose. And they're more emotional. And I think that Steinbeck's palette is much, much larger than those of Fitzgerald or Hemingway or Bukowski or so many other writers I admire. Steinbeck's characters encompass so many different types of folks in so many different settings. And as an American, I so love how Steinbeck's prose, I think, really celebrates America yeah. and, and our natural environment and our people. I'm also, I'm, I'm influenced by Jack Kerouac. I love particularly his books on the road and the Dharma bums and the subterraneans. To me, he is able to describe particular settings, geography and people so well. And, and there's an exuberance, a passion, a, a joie de vivre, if you will, in Kerouac's prose that's just remarkable. Now, I know he wrote a lot of it on speed, and I'm certainly, I would never endorse that, but I would love to be able to convey the sense of action and, and presence and here and now uh, and excitement that, that Kerouac can convey. I like a lot of the humor of Charles Bukowski as found in Factotum and a Post Office and Women. There are so many people. I love Harry Cruz, a, a great George, South Georgia novelist from Bacon County. A Feast of Snakes is one of my favorites. Cruz, I think, does a great job of describing characters really well and putting them in hilarious situations. So there are, really, there are a lot of people. John Kennedy Toole is a, a favorite writer. I love A Confederacy of Dunces about quirky characters in New Orleans. And actually, his first novel and only other novel, The Neon Bible, which he wrote when he was 16, I think is a remarkable book. Now, it's, it's very depressing. It's mm. uh, you know, in tone completely opposite from A Confederacy of Dunces, but boy, it's remarkably well done. So I really, I, I love primarily American writers, but, but there are foreign writers I adore as well. I mean, Milan Kundera of uh, Czechoslovakia or now the Czech Republic. I think he's phenomenal. The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, uh, The Unbearable Likeness of Being. And there's actually a really fine Philip Kaufman directed the film version of that too with Daniel Day-Lewis. George Orwell, I think is phenomenal. 1984 remains, I think, the best book ever written about politics. Hmm. And I think it's even better than Machiavelli's The Prince. And I think even though when Orwell wrote 1984, he wrote it in 1948, inspired primarily by the, the horrors of Stalinist Russia, and he inverted the year to you know, 1948 to 1984. But I think it's even more relevant to today's rapidly ascending statist and totalitarian influences uh, all over the world. 
So I, while Steinbeck would be you know, first among my literary heroes, there are so many others uh, who I adore as well. Steinbeck, certainly a great one. One of my favorites as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and let me say this. It's probably not a coincidence that a disproportionately large share of my favorite writers have been fellow Southerners. And, and I should certainly mention that I have really admired some of uh, William Faulkner's work. To me, like, uh, gosh, his short story, The Bear, I think mm. is just, the bulk of it, I think is phenomenal. His ability to describe characters without having to, to give them much dialogue at all is amazing. Now, I, he loses me at times. Uh, he, he, um, you know, when he, when he goes really modernistic, almost surreal, you know, when he just sort of suspends punctuation and, and goes into free form, free thought. But, uh, Faulkner at his best, I think is, is pretty um, remarkable too. Well, a moment ago, you mentioned humor, and there's some humor in this book, but... Thank you. Did I'm, you laugh out loud, any? I did, Oh, yes. good, good. But my question, what kind of things do you find tickle you? What gets your funny bone going? Well, let me start with literature. The funniest short story I have ever read, and I read it 40 years ago when I was in a college freshman English class is, I think, the last short story that Flannery O'Connor ever wrote, another wonderful Southern writer. And boy, I really encourage people to visit her childhood home in Savannah, Georgia. Hmm. It's on one of those beautiful squares. And then, even better, I encourage people to visit her home in Milledgeville, Georgia. And there are still peacocks there. <laughs> and of course, she and her mother had peacocks there as well. But Revelation, I believe, was the last short story Flannery O'Connor ever wrote. And in fact, I, I digress a bit, but I can't resist. When I uh, made a, a pilgrimage to Flannery O'Connor's grave in Milledgeville, someone had placed a beautiful peacock feather on her gravestone, which I, I just think is wonderful. Well, she finished that story, I think, in the hospital when she was dying. And that story made me laugh out loud more than any other story or maybe anything I've ever uh, read. And I remember I was so taken with it that I shared it with my mother. And I've never heard my mother laugh louder before or since from reading that story. And it's it was just about people in a, a as I recall, I think a, a doctor's office, doctor's office or dentist's office. It's been so long since I read it. And uh, it was just a riot. You know, these people with very different personalities thrown together in difficult circumstances I mentioned John Kennedy Tools, A Confederacy of Dunces. That's one of the funniest. That's probably the second funniest novel I've ever read. I think the funniest novel I ever read would be would still be Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaint. That was absolutely hysterically funny. I thought, and I think, and something I really love about Roth's Portnoy's Complaint, the breast is also good and funny, but not as funny as Portnoy's Complaint. Something I love about that is something that I think speaks well of Roth as a writer. And, and this gets to what I think is what I think represents the best of literature. Roth is writing in that book about urban, Northeastern, largely Jewish life. And I read that as a, a teenager in the fairly rural South, a Southern Presbyterian. Oh, I'm, I'm Presbyterian like Elton Peabody in the novel. So that's another similarity. But yet, I, I totally related to all those characters of Roth. I mean, I thought they were hilarious. And, <laughs> and, and I recognized, I think, those same characters among people I knew. We had different accents and went to different churches and had some different expressions. But, but there was, you know, there was a universality <laughs> of humanity that came through. So in terms of writing, I, I, I think Flannery O'Connor and, uh, John Kennedy Toole and Roth would, would be some of the funniest. Oh, but Charles Bukowski is hilarious, as mentioned earlier. I've probably laughed more at movies, though, than I have uh, reading literature. And as far as movie humor goes, I've always, ever since I was a child, I've loved the old comedians. Harold Lloyd, great silent Daredevil comic. Buster Keaton, mm -hmm. great silent comic. The Great Stone Face. 
in the talkie era, W.C. Fields this is hilarious. Gosh, it's a gift. The bank dick, never give a sucker an even break. Uh, the man on the tra- flying trapeze, those are probably my favorite Fields films. My all-time favorite comedians of the old classic era, uh, 1930s and early 40s, would be Laurel and Hardy. Oh, they're, they're just magnificent. And, and all, it's such clean, sweet humor, and it's universal. A dear friend of mine, uh, Wu Zhongyi, talked about growing up in China, even in communist China, Laurel and Hardy were beloved. More recently, my all-time favorite comic, and the person who's prompted me to laugh more than anyone, I would say, would be Woody Allen. And there again, here's someone like Roth, New York City, Jewish gentleman, very different background from mine. But yet, to me, his humor, you know, funny is funny. And he's incredibly witty and original. I, I love his films. I also really enjoyed his short stories. Who else? Steve Martin, in terms of television. Oh, and John Candy. And in terms of television, the original Saturday Night Live cast in the mid-late 70s, I thought was hilarious. And a second city television or SCTV, the Canadian sort of equivalent of SNL, although SCTV came first. In terms of stand-up comics, while I love clean humor, and when I wrote Deep in the Forest, one of my resolutions, while I didn't, I had almost no rules when I wrote the book, but one of them was I wanted this to be a book that my parents could enjoy. And so if you notice in this novel, One of the reasons why I think is really suitable for virtually everyone is there's no profanity. There's no smoking, drinking, drugs, sex, or violence. I mean, 98% of it is rated G. I mean, and maybe two or three pages are rated PG-13. But it's still deal. It's But it's still a lot of fun. I mean, you don't have to have profanity, sex, or violence to have a good time. And to me, this book, this story deals with a lot of really heavy-duty, serious, dramatic subjects, but it still is something that that can be told in a lighthearted, fun way, and you don't have to be profane and graphic and gratuitous to convey heavy-duty material. And so I love the clean comics. Jonathan Winters, uh, you know, from television and also some films. I love the old Andy Griffith show, and All in the Family. No, no, All in the Family is, you know, I would say rated PG-13. But All in the Family had almost no profanity, and it was hilarious. I would say the cleanest, the most, probably my favorite contemporary stand-up comic would be Jim Gaffigan. Yeah. who And I love his books, too. They're very funny. I don't know how factual they are. I mean, they they... Each chapter could be a short story or it could be, you know, I think they're at least the chapters are inspired by his real life with his very large family of young children. But uh, Gaffigan, his humor, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard him use a profanity, but yet he's hilarious, often hysterically funny. And I love the self deprecating humor. And I love how, like the best of George Carlin, who was not always clean, but Gaffigan will convey a lot of real world, everyday situations that we can all relate to. And he will convey ideas that and thoughts that will be, I think, if Ron is too scared to admit <laughs> in all but uh, among the closest friends for fear of being embarrassed. And, but he will convey what we're really thinking. And now, having said that, I think that you can have some really hilarious blue comedy, too. I mean... I am just so glad that I took advantage of opportunities to see George Carlin at the Fox Theater in March of 1979 with my dear friend Stanton Robertson. I still have the ticket stub for that. I also still have the ticket stub for uh, having seen Richard Pryor at the Fox in 1983 on what turned out to be his last tour uh, with my uh, longtime buddy, dear friend Dennis Kirk. We were on the second row. But I wasn't laughing at their profanity. I love what George Carlin said one time about his use of foul language. He said, it's the spice of my dialogue or of of his shtick. It's sort of, it's a sweetener. Yeah. Um, But it's not, it's not the noun. 
it's not even the verb. It's an adjective. It's not the thrust. It's not the heart of it. And so I love to laugh. And quite frankly, a lot of stuff I will not read. And a lot of movies I won't see if I think that they're just going to depress me. Yeah. And that's not to say that there's not a lot of great depressing stuff. But when I wrote this book, I wanted it, while I wanted it to grapple with really serious universal issues, finding religious meaning, finding purpose. Elton is wondering, did this terrifying experience I have, could it have been angels, all of the wheels of Ezekiel in the Bible? Was God sending me a sign? You know, what? how does God want me to process this? Why did this event happen to me? Am I too thick to understand the religious significance of it? Is there a religious significance? As serious as these issues of the book are, I wanted people, I wanted this to be a fun read. I wanted people to not be burdened by it. I wanted it to be a fun, enjoyable reading experience. I wanted to entice people to read. I mean, I think sadly now we're in an age when my sense is, and I could be wrong, and I hope I am wrong. I don't have any data to back me up about this. But my sense is that fewer and fewer Americans or a smaller and smaller percentage of Americans are reading, particularly reading books. I know that newspaper subscriptions have plummeted and newspapers are having to go almost completely online. And I worry that fewer people, particularly fewer men, are reading. Something that I noticed in teaching over the course of almost three and a half decades was that my sense was that fewer, a smaller and smaller share of my students were reading material other than what was required by classes. I mean, it was very difficult to get most students to even read the recommended or required readings for, for class. But I remember growing up in college, so many of my friends and I, I mean, we would discuss literature. We were reading classics and we were reading novels written by people who, who were long dead. You know, that was fun. And, and my sense is now that we just have a less and less literate culture. Mm. And so I wanted to write something that would be really accessible. I didn't want anything Faulknerian, as wonderful as Faulkner is. I wanted this to be something that everybody could enjoy. And I am no great intellectual. I, I, I couldn't pretend to hope to write like a Faulkner. I wanted to write in my, in my own natural style, the way I talk. And I wanted to, but I wanted to, to spice it up with, with, uh, fun sounding names and with really fun, quirky characters, interesting and exciting and dramatic situations and with a lot of humor. And a lot of the humor is based on real life humor in my life. I mean, in the, on the acknowledgements page, two of the people to whom the book uh, uh, is uh, dedicated are uh, two of my favorite aunts. And they were so sweet and they were perhaps the two least pretentious people I've ever been blessed to know. And they were just naturally funny. They, I don't think they thought of themselves as being funny at all, but maybe it's a sign of what a pretentious mannered age we live in now <laughs> that these two aunts, by just being themselves, they really stood out. And so uh, I just wish that they were still with us. Uh, I think they would have enjoyed the chapter that featured them. And I bet you, well, I don't think you've, I think they come in the second half of the book. I don't think you've gotten to them yet. But I love writing stuff that makes me laugh out loud. I mean, if I, I mean, I, when I try to be funny, uh, I don't try to force anything. I try to, if I think of something that I think is witty, something that makes me chuckle, then I'll try to include it in the novel. And, and it has to fit. I mean, it has to be part, it, it can't be utterly foreign. It can't be just completely added to hmm. uh, the, the natural thrust or the, the, the movement of the novel, of the plot. But I do try to have as much humor as possible, provided it is germane to what's going on. This last question, it may seem like a simple question, but I want you to go with your gut here. Okay. Are novels more than just stories? Oh, absolutely. Someone said, and I cannot remember who it was, was it C.S. Lewis? I'm not sure. Someone wrote that part of the great experience of reading a really good novel is to have the sense that, oh, wow, you too 
to, to not feel as lonely, mm. to come across someone who has thought similar thoughts to your own. And one of the reasons I wrote Deep in the Forest was I had not read anything like this, the basic outlines of, of what would prove to be the story for Deep in the Forest that, that you know I had juggled in my mind for some time. And so I thought, I, I need to write it. And I, I bet you I'm far from the only person who's wondered what it would be like to uh, have a, a bizarre UFO experience and, and have to deal with the aftermath. I mean, 95% of the novel is, is the protagonist, Elton Peabody, grappling with the, the results of this experience or the, the fallout from it. And so, yes, I think a really good novel can, in addition to hopefully spiriting the reader away, helping the reader escape from whatever boredom or drama or stress he or she may be enduring in his or her real life, I think that a good novel can get us to think about serious issues in ways that we might not have thought about before, and not just intellectually, but emotionally. I mean, in this book, I want to believe that one of the reasons why I had a hard time finding a publisher is because the book is not easily pigeonholed into any one genre. It's it's many genres. It's Even though it's not a real long book, it's 180-something pages, and it's overall, I mean, it's, it's a, a fun, fairly light read. It does deal with a lot of serious subjects, you know, finding purpose in life. But I think the, the biggest theme of the book, I, I hope, I would love if, I would love it if a lot of people would come away from the book thinking that the ultimate message of this book is to take risks, mm. to reach beyond yourself. To us, Faulkner once wrote, don't just try to be better than others or your competitors, but be better than yourself. And the lead character, Elton Peabody, while he, I certainly would not classify him as a clinical depressive, he's ultimately a pretty sad character mm -hmm. um, in that he has a lot of insecurities, even though he's a really successful young high school history teacher. He's beloved by his students and respected by his peers, but he's very insecure. He has a lot of insecurities, and because of his insecurities, he never leaves his hometown. He wants to lead a very safe life. He doesn't finish graduate school. He, he stops after he gets his master's degree, and he goes back to teach within the relatively safe confines of his old hometown high school where he graduated from not too many years before. And he's too shy to pursue many girls. To, to he, he doesn't have a lot of dating experience or girlfriend experience. And shyness is a real curse. If I could convey just one message from this book, it might be this is pursuant to this notion that we need to take risks. We need to fight shyness. I mean, I, I think that, and Lord knows, I grew up very shy. I was always, I think, naturally shy. But I think that there is a tendency in our culture to think, oh, it's very sweet to be shy. Mm. And maybe so, but I really believe that shyness takes away it, it prevents us from seizing an enormous number of opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think Woody Allen is right. The saddest thing in life is a missed opportunity. Yeah. And while I certainly would never want anyone to take a reckless, unnecessary risk, uh, I would never want anyone to try illegal drugs or to drive recklessly without a seatbelt or anything like that. And I certainly wouldn't, you know, I, I agree with Jimi Hendrix that people should, we should have no patience or tolerance for people who are reckless with other people's feelings. Mm. We should always treat each other with respect. I mean, follow Christ's golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As Kurt Vonnegut said, oh, he's another major literary influence. I love Kurt Vonnegut. You know, Vonnegut said, be, we've got to be kind to each other. 
And he was someone who was, frankly, at most a deist, if not an atheist. Hmm. I think that shy people are way too inhibited from taking necessary risks. Dennis Prager, my guru, I, he is the greatest living philosopher, in my opinion. I love Dennis Prager. Uh, his radio program and, and his books. Well, Dennis Prager recently said, you can live a safe life or you can live a full life, <laughs> but you cannot live both. It's one or the other. And I think to go back to something that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said, Reverend King said that too many people are not really living. They're merely existing. Mm. And that is not a full life. Right. And I don't believe that Christ wants us to just exist. That's not why we're put on this planet. I believe that every person has a purpose. You know, it's been said by, I think, many people that we're the only one of God's creatures for whom there has to be a lot more to life than just the next meal, sleep, finding a mate, having babies. You know, we're the only species that has to have purpose, that has to have meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think even atheists, especially atheists, have a deep spiritual hole in their hearts that has to be filled with something. And I think that in this ever more secular age, we have an epidemic of people desperately searching for meaning. Many people find it in work. They become workaholics. Others find it in sports. They're sports addicts. Uh, for others, it's in alcohol or, or recreational illegal drugs. For others, it's sex. For others, it's gambling. For many, I think for a record number, it's politics. I think for a record number of people today, their religion is politics and their faith is their uh, political uh, ideology and their church is their political party. Well, I think for, for, for Elton and, and too many shy people, they play it safe, way too safe. So, oh, let's never leave our hometown. Let's just stay within our comfort zone. And, but the problem, as Elton realizes, is that's not a prescription for happiness because you're not remotely reaching your full potential. If you have any ambition, and Elton is an ambitious person. And But his shyness prevents him from fulfilling his professional and his relationship potential. And Elton, though, early in the novel, very early in the first chapter, for whatever reason, he finds himself captivated by that distant light, that glowing bright white light in the woods that's causing all the neighborhood's do uh, dogs, including his own, General Longstreet, named for a great Confederate general, who was about the only general on either side of the war between the states, who was a great civil rights champion, who was an abolitionist. Well, in any event, Elton Peabody goes out in the woods, and he's the only person in this whole town of Cleburne, among the roughly 20,000 people who live there, who follows one of these UFO lights that night into the woods, and he becomes mesmerized by it. And even though the light becomes incredibly bright, and there, it's accompanied by this ferociously loud hum, he's still drawn to it. He's the one dude in the whole county who's got the guts to go into that clearing in the forest. And yes, he has a terrifying experience. He's terrified, and, and he's so terrified that he blacks out. And yes, he's afraid for most of the rest of the novel. He's still freaked out. I guess he's really, I didn't think of it at the time when I wrote this, but I, he probably is suffering some kind of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. But as unpleasant as his situation is, trying to figure out what happened and trying to uh, avoid being stereotyped or caricatured as that UFO man, uh, he doesn't want to become the joke of his school or his town. He realizes as the story progresses that, you know, yeah, it's a mystery, but I'm okay. I was not harmed physically. And I've still done a great job teaching, and I haven't lost my reputation. And he realizes as, as time goes on, and he, he, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, he gets back in the arena. He realizes, you know what? I'm pretty doggone blessed. Yeah, I had a traumatic experience, but hey, I didn't have cancer. I, I didn't even get a scratch. And gosh, I didn't lose a loved one. 
I'm not handicapped in any way. I mean, I've got it pretty doggone good. And now more people are interested in me precisely because I had this bizarre experience. And Elton doesn't put it into these words, but he was the only one with the guts, with the chutzpah to, to go and, and search out this UFO. And the book is all about facing your fears, really. I didn't consciously think of this when I wrote it, Paul, but Rereading it several times, I really think this was a subconscious theme. Think about it. Elton, he, when he reaches a certain point of comfort, several chapters into the book, he realizes, okay, I'm, I'm okay. And I'm not being laughed at so much anymore. And my life is still going along. Okay. I'm still kind of freaked out a little bit. I, I want to find some purposes. You know, I want to figure out what was it I saw in the woods and why did, it, did this experience happen to me? But he realizes I'm okay. But then he starts to figure out that, you know, maybe I could conquer some of this lingering unease about this episode by going back to the scene of the crime, so to speak. And it's a big deal. You know, will he have the guts, the courage to go back to the scene? And uh, he eventually does with his best friend. And that's what friends are for, right? I mean, <laughs> um, you know, Dennis Prager says that we need to have friends who will encourage us, who will support us, who are good for us and with whom we can confide. And so friendship, having really meaningful friend, friends, uh, close friends, that's an important theme of the book, too. And then Elton, uh, eventually he realizes that, you know, really, I ought to uh, ask out that pretty young new English teacher at the school. Why not? And if she wants to ask about UFOs, hey, that's a, a good conversation piece. <laughs> and uh, eventually... He even is tempted to, to go back to the site of this terrifying experience at night. In other words, he only gets better. He only feels less afraid, more secure, more confident when he faces these fears. Right. And I think if, if I could will people to come away with one message from this book, it is to face our fears, to not live strictly in a safe zone. You know, I know people have been really freaked out about COVID and, and hey, I got my vaccination shots and, you know, I followed the rules about wearing a mask indoors when I had to. I'm not saying people should be careless about it, but I think that it's really negative that now so many people are saying, oh, be safe, be safe. Well, to me, safety is is not in sync with freedom. And again, uh, you can lead a, a safe life or a full life, but to lead a full life involves a lot of risk. You have to risk getting hurt, having your heart broken. But I'm telling you, if you don't ask out, you know, that pretty girl, you're going to regret it. If you don't travel, you're going to regret it. Uh, sure, you could be mugged. Sure, big cities are more dangerous than small towns. But the reality is that the vast, vast majority of people who travel don't get mugged. And everybody who, who, unless you live in a monastery or a convent, everybody who ever dates is going to be hurt. But you know what? You survive and you, you, you get stronger and tougher. And so I'm concerned that we're now living in an ever more neurotic age obsessed with safety. Yeah. And I think that discourages people from reaching beyond themselves, from leaving their uh, safety zone, their comfort zone. I want people to realize that for to lead a happy, productive, successful life, you have to take risk. You need to be, if you have any ambition, you've got to reach beyond yourself and you need to take chances. Not stupid, not suicidal, not reckless risk, but go beyond yourself. Live to your full potential. And it's okay to be embarrassed. It's okay for people to laugh at you. Grow some thicker skin. Yeah. Be stronger. Be tougher. And if people are not supportive or helpful towards you, leave them. Don't hang out with, with people. Don't choose as your friends people who are not good for you. Make your own life. Be your own architect. Don't be a pa don't be one of the passive uh, sheeple. <laughs> be your own architect. Lead your own life. This is America. It's still 
the freest country with the most opportunities of any nation in the history of God's green earth. We are living, for all of our problems, we're living in the year of our Lord, 2021 AD. We have never had so much wealth. We've never had so much cheap food. We've never have, we've never had so much technology. It's never been easier to travel, to meet people, to take risks, to try new things, to write on the computer. So there's a great big wonderful world out there and people need to explore it as much as possible and climb out of themselves. People are capable, we're all capable of so much more than we want to acknowledge. And if we play it safe, we will never achieve anything. As Robert Kennedy said, nothing worthwhile, you you cannot achieve anything really worthwhile unless you risk great failure. Mm -hmm. And think about it. A lot of people, I think, have said, and I agree with it, that think about everything in your life that you're really pleased with. I know the Bible says we shouldn't be proud, but think of all of the things you've done in your life that you regard as your best achievements, that you want in your obituary. Did they not all involve a lot of risk, a lot of pain, a lot of work, a lot of fine-tuning, a lot of getting knocked down, but as Teddy Roosevelt said, picking yourself back up and getting back in the arena again? Hmm. Isn't everything worthwhile something that involves risk and difficulty? We only grow when we challenge ourselves. And I think that for shy people like Elton, the society more than ever today is encouraging people to stay shy, to stay ensconced firmly Mm. in their narrow little world. And it's too easy now to do that. People can now work from home. That's been accelerated by the COVID mess. And hey, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a writer. But I do try to get out a great deal. People need to get out and explore and do things. We've never had it so good. Travel has never been easier. And so people and people need to realize that, you know, the clock, as has been said so often, it never stops ticking. And Paul Songus, God rest his sweet soul, Paul Songus, late U.S. senator and congressman from Massachusetts and a presidential candidate, he wrote one of the most inspiring statements I've ever read about death. He wrote precisely because, and I'm paraphrasing, but he, he wrote precisely because this life is so finite and brief. That should concentrate our mind. That should kick us into fifth gear, so mm-hmm. to speak, to not put off anything. Mm-hmm. And I can tell young listeners, as I told many a class of my students, the older you get, the faster time flies. I mean, when I was young, I, I thought it would take forever to, to get to Friday. Now Friday comes and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, where did the week go? And I can also say to your listeners, as I told many a class, and I'm 59 now, 49 plus interest to in my students, <laughs> I can tell you that with, with almost no exceptions, and I bet you I speak for most everyone who is in the third or fourth quarter of life, all of my regrets are about missed opportunities. <laughs> it's not a, sure, I'd, I wish I had more hair. I wish I could eat whatever I wanted and still not have to worry about gaining weight. Sure, I wish that, uh, you know, physically, that there wasn't the decline that there inevitably will be. But to me, every regret I've ever had is a missed opportunity. Not telling loved relatives how much I love them. And it's too late now. And I didn't tell them when when you know they were still around because oh I was too shy or oh gosh that that might be kind of icky or uncomfortable embarrassing you know a man telling someone else that he loves loves her or him you know not pursuing travel opportunities or concert opportunities you know one of the reasons why I am blessed to have seen so many great rock stars and stand up comics who have you know gone on to glory is because I realized pretty young, you know what? So many of my musical and comic heroes die young, drugs, et cetera. And so, hey, uh, and I use that as a rationalization for seeing as many bands and performers as I could. And I'm glad I did because so many of them did die young. Andy Kaufman, Richard Pryor, a lot of them. 
But I regret all the, the shows I didn't go to because, oh, well, it costs too much money or, oh, they'll come back on another tour. Well, no, so often there is no more tour. And I told many an advisee in my office, I know your old man may want you to major in accounting, but don't major in accounting or anything if you don't really want to. Mm. Follow follow your – pursue whatever is your dream. If you really want – if you love history – What I would say is you should major in whatever topic you find yourself naturally thinking, reading, talking, and writing about on your own, independent of any college class requirement. And if it's history, then that's what you should major in history. If it's politics, you should major in political science. If it's law, you should major in pre-law. If it's English, you should major in English. If it's uh, music, major in music. Because if you choose the wrong major, if you go with what you think will earn you a good living or please your family, that's a prescription for a heck of a long and lonely, unsatisfied, regretful life. Because I don't care what job, what occupation, what profession you choose, you're going to bring work home with you emotionally. It's just like, absolutely, ask out that good looking gal or guy, whoever you, you really think who you're attracted to and who you think. Uh, you're compatible with, who you share interests with. Because, man, if you don't and and you end up with someone who really is not a good fit for you emotionally or in terms of compatibility, that's going to be a lifelong regret. So I don't know what it is about contemporary society. I don't know if it's a fear of failure, a belief that perfection is 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 the standard, but there seems to be a, a general inhibition about taking risks, taking chances out of a fear of any kind of failure. And failure is okay. I mean, get back up, get back in the arena. If one career doesn't pan out, choose another. But, you know, this life, I don't think this life was meant to be played safely. Again, don't take stupid risks. Don't drive too fast. Mm. Wear your seatbelt. Don't smoke. Don't drink or don't drink to excess. But we're not put here, I don't think, to just live in a cocoon. But explore all that life has to offer. I desperately want to believe, and I do believe that there is a God and there is a heaven. But, you know, this is the only life that I know I'm guaranteed. And I don't know how long I've got. (laughs) And so even if you don't believe, or all the more if if you're not sure about the hereafter, that's all the more reason to live life to its fullest. So Elton and every other character in the novel who grows only grows by reaching beyond himself, by going outside of his self-limiting parameters. And so if this book can inspire people to take more chances, to not live in fear, I would be so pleased. And I would love for all the readers of this novel to please write me. I have my same old university email address, Young at U-N-G dot E-D-U. I'm also on Facebook as Douglas Young. I would love to get, I am already enjoying to get all kinds of reader replies, analyses of the book. That's been really gratifying. And maybe a lot of readers may come away with, with certain themes, meanings of the book that, that I didn't even intend. And, and hey, all the better. So that's Douglas dot Young at ung.edu. Yes, sir. All right. So, Deep in the Forest, published by Newman Springs Publishing. They can get it on Barnes & Noble. They can get it on Amazon. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming down here. Thank you so much for doing this interview yet again. Thank you so very much, Paul. God bless and keep you always. This is such a thrilling, exciting time in my life. And I am so honored and touched and humbled to be able to to share part of it with you. Thank you, sir. I'm honored. And one thing real quick that I'll say, I was telling Dr. Young as he got here, of the 900 or so interviewees, I have never, ever had one come to my abode, (laughs) the first one. I am so honored (laughs) and thrilled. I, I am just really touched that you would invite me here. We don't live that far from each other. I'm in... Gainesville, Georgia, and I don't want to, I don't know how private you are about where you live, but you don't live too far from me. And so, and now that I'm retired from the professorate, my schedule is a lot more flexible. And so I was able to come and visit and, uh, and it's been a joy. Thank you.
Been a pleasure. Bum up ba da beep up boop dot boop da beep but a leap a knock the bees I walk on teach a girl a get it no it's a girl oh is it and got got a kiss a car oh oh is it oh it's a girl oh 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 I'm swagging I believe it's a girl we don't take a walk again goodbye.